Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. Hi everybody, Wayne Dorban here from our Northern Colorado headquarters of Economics and Nurse the Planet. And we are so excited. We've got with us here today Evan Folds from Wilmington, North Carolina. Evan, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Awesome. Um, and we're trying something really interesting. Emily's sitting here next to me. Um, I'll actually show the camera up to her. There she is. And she's got my iPad. And we are going out live over Meerkat. And she said, she said right now we're having audio only. Is it, is it going back. in? It's back. So, um, so I don't know if you've ever used Meerkat, any of you that are watching, but Meerkat is a relatively new app that you can put onto your mobile devices, so on your phone or on your tablet, and it will allow you to broadcast things live. So it can broadcast anything that you'd like to do. There's been like the number two in popularity on Meerkat right now over the last week was U2, the band, U2. And so they obviously have used Meerkat to do something. And so there, there's lots of behind scenes stuff that's going on. So Emily's actually taking pictures of us as we're sitting here and, and hopefully the, the screen where she's going to be seeing Evan. And how many people are on there now, does it say? Because three. three people have already come on and we just, this just sort of spontaneously people will come on. Emily, when you see messages down there, if there's ones where they're asking for questions and such, just put it in, put in, you know, type the question, the answer. Um, and we'll, we'll make the Meerkat available also. As everyone knows, we, we replay these, um, so we'll edit them. And interestingly, we're using a different wall today, and notice that it's green back here. We're going to actually see if we can do some really cool stuff, and maybe we'll take some of Evan's images and we'll make it look like we're in North Carolina in the background um, for our green screen. So, um, it's gotten warm here in Colorado. We're out of our um, our wet season that we were in for quite a while. Matter of fact, the last time we talked, we had probably just barely gotten out of that. It's really summer now. Uh, not as hot probably as it is there. What's your temperature in North Carolina today, Evan? Oh, you know, I, I bet it's above 100. Yeah, yeah, we're um we're probably in the high 80s, maybe low 90s. But even here at that, it's really dry, and so it's not that tough temperature-wise. But um, Anyway, I'm going to just introduce Evan real, real quick. We're going to have fun here for the next hour, as we always try to do. We try to make it right on time to get through with this so that everybody has a chance to uh, get on to what their lives are. Please put your questions on the screen if you have them for us. Um, and, you know, we've got a new ability now um, that we can actually have people um, come in and talk to us if they'd like. We can actually add them and put them on screen if you'd like to be. So um, if you want to do that, you might just indicate that in a message that you put. So you can type your chat messages. We'll try to communicate with you. How many people we have now? Because okay. it'll go, yeah. So there's five people watching us on Meerkat, and, and uh, we'll just have some fun. So um, what we'll start with is just to let, let, let uh, Evan talk about himself. Evan and I met, um, I think, for the first time, quite a little while ago, actually over LinkedIn, and then we've recently connected quite a bit more frequently, and we're actually hopefully going to be doing some fun stuff together, um, collaborating on some things. And so I'm just going to turn it over to you, Evan. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and your business and just sort of give us an introduction. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me today, Wayne. Uh, my uh, experience has, has been... Um, you know, basically to, to wade into the environment of health and agriculture um, as a novice, which I think is the position that most people start out in. And what my business um, all-encompassing has become is kind of a, a methodology of how to get more people involved and how to allow them to have their own moment of kind of coming to terms with how we teach ourselves versus how we actually leverage the power of the natural world in, in farming and in health. Um, so I started a business of uh, over 13 years ago called Progressive Gardens and it's a retail gardening store and I've since started a company called Progressive Farms that is a uh, a farming business we have a 10 acre farm uh, that we're contracted to grow in our town and in Wilmington North Carolina 
and it's also a product development and um, distribution company that, that sells and consults to farmers and lawn care companies and retail garden centers all over the country and all over the world for that matter. Um, so we're on the cusp of starting a, a, a rebranding of our, pro our project that we're calling Bee Agriculture. And the, the concept being that we want to invite people to be a part of agriculture, you know, really whether you like it or not, you already are. Um, so, you know, we're trying to champion ideals such as, you know, as Wendell Berry said, eating is an agricultural act. Uh, you know, what we think we grow. It's, it's, our, it's been my experience and, and it's my opinion that, you know, people that are informed and that they're operating in ways and using their buying power to really encourage what they want to see, that that's a, a much more healthy tool to affect the change that we want to see than it is lobbying or, uh, you know, it, any, any other matter of, uh, of social change. So, you know, my experience has been through the ins and outs of, of all of these environments. And, um, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to, to talk a little bit about what we do and, and maybe how we can connect with more people to do more of it. That's great. Um, boy, there's been some really cool pictures that, that I've been seeing and the audience hasn't yet, but I know we're all going to see all of them. Um, and I saw one that was really cool. I just got to use this one. There was a there was a Ford truck in there. What what year is your Ford truck that the banner was on? <laughs> you ask about the truck. Old trusty. It's in 1985. Well, late model. Just had fuel injection. So it's actually got about 80,000 miles on it. Uh, at literally real miles because the guy I bought it from drove it to the dump and back for 20 years. So it's got factory upholstery. It's you know it's in very good working condition. So let's see if I can go through mine. I have a 81, a two 1990s, a 1991, and a 2001, and a 2006. Oh, we got um, the bases covered. Yeah, and honestly, the coolest of all of them is that 81, which mm. is a little bit older than yours. Um, you know, roll down windows. So simple, and it's it it was pre-injection. I mean, it, it is just a dream. And then taking back further, I think I became sort of a Ford guy. My dad had a a Ford pickup when I was growing up, a '65 actually, and that was my first Ford that they put a camper on, and we travel all over the country. And so, um, I don't know whether Deb's got this one up now, but here's a very cool picture of of you and and I'm assuming um, some family members. Um, mm -hmm. If you can see that one that's up there now, maybe tell us what, uh, what, who that is and tell us about what that picture is. Yeah, that's um, quintessential of my family. You know, we're always trying to have fun. That's my wife, Mary Margaret, and my daughter, Blythe. And I have a son, Dylan, who is two years old now. Or, I'm sorry, three <laughs> years old. Time is flying. He's almost four. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we're, you know, that's, that's just us on, on an average lazy day. And I think she's got pictures of, of the, the four of you here that we'll see also. So speaking of that, let's let's take you back a little ways. Um, you know, tell us tell us about where you grew up. Um, here we go. There's there's the there's the, the the other the other three in the tribe other than yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, tell us where you grew up and maybe one event from your youth that you remember that that really caused you to pursue your current life path. Um, just sort of. Tell us about your, your, your youth time, and, and then if there was one event that you can remember, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, you asked, uh, you presented me with some questions that, you know, really forced me to think about my past in a way that I'm not used to doing. I'm, I'm very uh, well equipped at talking about my businesses, but not so much about myself, uh, which is something that I'm hoping you can help me with uh, as we do these uh, approaches that we're doing here in the interviews, but you know, I, I grew up. Uh, my my parents were divorced when I was four, and uh, they both remarried fairly quickly and had children in, in second marriages. Um, so my my family is is quite diverse, um, and it's very large. Um, but I, I can't say that I grew up in any kind of environment that really connected me to what I do now, uh, other than the value of family. And you know, my grandparents, my grandfather specifically, was the editor of the Greensboro News and Record, and uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and you know he taught me the value of writing, um, which I've, you know, taken with me my whole life. I, I write in you know all kinds of international publications uh, on gardening and health. Um, so you know I, I did learn those valuable lessons uh, of of how to organize myself, but it, it really wasn't until I went to school. Uh, I wanted to be a marine biologist, and I ever since I can remember, it's what I wanted to do. And I, I found out very quickly when I got to school that unless I knew my specialty and what I wanted to specialize in 
it was very difficult to graduate and have the type of career that I envisioned for myself uh, in general. So I kind of went, took the, the general approach, and I was a biology degree, and I, I got a degree in religion. Um, and I would say it was more probing than it was, uh, you know, trying to pursue a certain uh, trade per se. And I got out of school. I was not inspired by what I learned. I, again, I think I, I learned how to learn. Um, but at that point, I didn't really even know what it is that I wanted to know. And I really find that that's the case with many people coming through those ranks these days is we're really not championed to connect with these things that we're passionate about through our education. And so I moved to the Virgin Islands, I, uh, opposite of what I was supposed to be doing, and it ended up being very serendipitous. I, I developed a, a roommate down there that uh, was connected to a, what's called a biodynamic farmer, um, the methods of Rudolf Steiner. And it was the first I'd ever learned of that. And I found a book uh, called Secrets of the Soil that uh, literally changed my life. Uh, it, it inspired me in ways that I'd never experienced before, and it really answered a lot of the philosophical questions and, and interest that I had in uh, gardening and in and, and these, you know, top-level issues as I see it. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of pursued the path of investigating what it would mean to make a career out of these concepts, and there was not a store like Progressive Gardens. Uh, there was one store. It was in Asheville, North Carolina, and a friend of mine had happened to work there and knew I was a biology major and knew how to connect with people in terms of the natural world. So we, we started talking about it. And, Back then, the banks gave you money, and uh, we got a loan and started a business. And 13 years later, here I am. Um, so, I, I, you know, to to the moment, I think the of what changed me. I, I don't know if I'd call it youth. I think I was a bit of a late bloomer in terms of my career, maybe early in a lot of contexts, but in terms of really finding my passion, um, I'd probably point to that book, Secrets of the Soil. You know, I, I think that, and I'm not alone in that. Uh, that book is 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 really a, uh, you know is the standard bearer for super sensible and, and energetic farming, if you will. Uh, and, and that's really, I can't think, one of the nuances that we approach that is really unique and is desperately needed uh, in, in the realms of agricultural and health. Very cool. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Emily's, Emily's getting figured out how she can get good views of the screen here. This is actually working pretty well with the meerkat. So I think there's like 19 or 20 people on there now. And I know that number will just kind of keep growing as we go. It's kind of a cool little tool. Um, so you, you mentioned a couple things about the school side. So where did you go? Where did you get the, where did you go for your marine biology work? Where did you go to school? Uh, it was the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And they're world renowned in marine biology. Um, but, you know, like I said, when I, when I got to school, I, I took all the necessary courses and, you know, you, Anytime you specialize, there's more school involved. Um, but I, I think it was it, it was more of a, a wandering in, into the abyss of than it was uh, a focus on a certain certain trade um, that really brought me to where it needed to be. I, I, I really like in my experience to date is kind of hanging on the steering uh, a little bit. We call it the vortex. You know, the idea that you know when you really find that vein of where you need to be, the right situations and the right people come to the party, and and that's you know really a lot of what we're experiencing now and, and putting our projects together to try to take it to the next level. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure I haven't told this on any of these, and I think we're up to maybe a hundred of these webinars we've done now, but I want to mention it because it's relevant to your, to your story. Our stories are a little bit parallel mm -hmm. um, in that I also went to school in marine biology. Um, a story I rarely tell, but um, in my junior year, actually the start of my senior year, I moved into a new dormitory at college, and it was the University of California, Irvine, and we were trying to figure out ways that we could raise money to, you know, get stuff for the dorm, and somebody set, figured out how we could go on the show, Truth or Consequences, and, um, and so we brought a whole busload of people from the dorm down to the taping of the show, and they, before the show, they select the contestants. And I was chosen to be one of the contestants. And I'm pretty convinced that one of the reasons that I was chosen was that they asked everybody what their majors were. And everybody was giving sort of traditional sorts of things. And the, the guy came to me, and, and I said it was marine biology or oceanography. And, and he, for some reason, really keyed on that and asked some other questions. And, and I ended up getting on. Um, getting on a show, but here's where I was going with this. It wasn't that story. That just came into it. One of the things that I had happen that sounds like maybe didn't happen for you 
when you were studying marine biology is you didn't have somebody who really grabbed onto you as a mentor and as an advisor and a trusted confidant for you because if that would have happened maybe things would have gone a little different direction. I did and it actually happened to me in high school interestingly. Um, I had a high school biology teacher who saw that what he was able to offer me was not enough. In other words he saw I wanted more and that I really was kind of thirsting for more knowledge and he had a brother who ran a little marine lab in San Diego which was about 50 miles south of where I was in high school and he got me to go be able to spend time with his brother and I'm going to shorten the story here but his brother's a rather famous name and I'll see if you know it at all. Do you, do you know the name Carl Hubbs? Does that mean anything to you? Don't feel bad no. by the way. It does No. It? Well Carl Hubbs was the founder of SeaWorld and that oh. little marine lab that I was at was called SeaWorld and it was before SeaWorld as we know it today was in place right. and, and Carl took me under his wing and frankly a lot because of what Carl did was what really kind of kept me directed towards marine biology and, and ended up keeping me there all the way through a PhD mm -hmm. um, and then wow. even beyond because I still have a huge love for all of those things that I learned back many many years ago but um, anyway a little message there a little contrast maybe between where you were because um, frankly I know that many people going through undergraduate degrees and I think it's a negative of our system don't end up having somebody grab onto them and you know, or see some value like like Carl saw uh, mm -hmm. in me. So mm -hmm. anyway, just I hadn't, I hadn't told that story here. I've, I've told it to a lot of other friends at other different times. There's a little longer that? version of it too, but anyway. How about um, that? Well, here's another one, and this is one that, that you knew you were going to get asked, so you've had time to think about this one, and our audience loves this, so I ask this of all of our speakers. When you were 15 years old and it was a beautiful Saturday afternoon and you didn't have any other things you had to be doing, mom and dad weren't saying or, or you know, anybody saying you got to do this, what would we find Evan doing on a beautiful Saturday afternoon? Uh, I was playing soccer. Okay. That, was, uh, that, that may not be the answer that would be expected given the talk maybe, but I, I uh, you know, I I was a big soccer player all the way up until college, um, and and I still love the game. Um, so that that was a, a pastime of mine. It you know it it really is, and I'll just reinforce it. It really is pretty stark for me. Um, it was almost like a light switch when when I read that book. Um, I I wasn't swimming around with thoughts of trying to go do what it is that I'm doing now when I was 15 years old. Um, that that you know I was almost uh, I was disconnected from that, and and, and I think really. The reality of that is why I'm so passionate about what I do and the way that I'm trying to do it is that you know I, I believe that the reason that I didn't have these principles and I wasn't so inspired by them the way that I am now is because I simply just wasn't offered to imagine them. Um, and it's a bit of a of an abstract thing, you know. I mean, one of the things Rudolf Steiner is a, is an, a huge influence on my life. He he was a, a a spiritual scientist back in the 1920s, um, and you know he was born in, in the 1800s, but uh, but he was really at his prime in the 1920s, and he developed biodynamic agriculture, he influenced education through Waldorf schools, uh, architecture, uh, economics, soci you know, societal uh, structure, all aspects of society, um, and you know he he was a really big inspiration of mine. So you know th this idea that um, you, you know life has become materialistic. Steiner actually offered uh, a construct of how to think about that. He called it Eremon and you know this idea that the world, is, the Kali Yuga is, a, is the way a lot of other people uh, are connected to it, but this idea that humans really were intended to go through this age of materialism, of being disconnected from the spiritual realm and that for me really resonates deeply because I, I was disconnected uh, in, in that way and I had, you know, I, when I was younger I, I, I recall uh, Young Life. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of that organization. It's a Christian organization, and you know it was very. Um, it it's was basically just down the road for me here. Is that right? Uh, Frontier Ranch, right? Um, that's right. Yeah, well, so Col I, that's one of the Colorado Springs is where Young Life is at. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I remember the the trip out to Frontier Ranch and, and doing those things in high school, and you know it was somewhat the popular thing to do in the group that I was in, and and it was very. You know, it, it opened my eyes up to the literalness uh, of religion in a way that I, 
you know, I should I should add when my parents divorced, my mom uh, married a Jewish man, and so uh, you know I went through uh, the holiday time with Hanukkah and Christmas. Um, so I I really wasn't steeped in in a lot of the tentacles that come along with you know the social construct of religion and these things that can influence in good ways and, and in bad in my view. Um, so I was a bit of a clean slate and. You know, I, I went to school wanting to figure out religion, uh, and a lot of it was, you know, that I wanted to know what where people were coming from. But I'd never been exposed to the actual structure of the Gospels and where they came from and the historicity of it. And so, you know, at that time, I was kind of digging for the facts. Um, and I think that, you know, really, any time you start a, a, a journey such as that in your life, the further you look, the less you know. And 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 that has been kind of a humbling experience for me all the way through this process is that as soon as we kind of entertain this idea that we're an expert, we shut ourselves off to the potential. Um, and, and we lose the humility that really allows us the experience to learn things that are different than how we think they are. Uh, we're kind of more powerful than we realize. So a lot of my approach is, is really trying to position things in, in that, for me personally, the first thing that I know is that I don't, you know, and, and that that's really where I, I find where faith comes from and you know you can use words that have different associations in different groups but that that's just the way that I that I see it so I think for me I, I offer that just to kind of color the idea of you know that what I'm doing now has not been a lifelong ambition um, after you know till I was about 23 years old well that, <laughs> and that, that's a great story because we all, they're all different for all of us. And, and I think your story is probably more common than, than let's say mine was, where mm. I've had sort of this passion that I've been able to follow since I can remember. Um, and yours just happened and you're a little bit older. So you've obviously talked about Rudolf Steiner here quite a bit. And I'm assuming that he's kind of that one person who influenced you. Um, is there anybody else that, that, you, that you've thought about that, that, that's been a, from your youth, not today. I'm sure we'll yeah. talk about more people that, that are influencing you now. But anyone else that that comes to mind? Uh, well, I think you know Rudolf Steiner is is a person that I would point to. He obviously was was not alive and uh, when I was young, um, and you know I didn't know him when I was young. My my grandparents were were a huge influence on my life. Um, they really represented to me, um, you know kind of the, the, a, um, a way in which to approach family. Um, you know, I, I'm the oldest of 12 cousins, and it was sort of four sisters, my mom and her three sisters, and they had 12 children, and I'm the oldest one. And for 35 years, I'm 37 years old, I guess it's been for 36 years now, um, you know, we took a trip to the beach at Figure Eight Island in North Carolina. And it, it's uh, it was an experience that, that really kind of, tightened our family to the extent that my cousins are almost like brother and sisters um, in a way that I feel is, is really unique and and that for me was a very especially being the oldest cousin was a was a very uh, very profound influence on me um, from a family perspective um, but you know coming through a, a divorced family and I don't want to paint the picture that it was hard my, I love my parents and my parents love me and they and they still like each other which is you know more than you could ask for in a lot of situations but it really presented me with a distance of uh, you know, not being molded, which in retrospect, of course, there's no consciousness towards that approach on my part, but in retrospect, it really allowed me to, to not be influenced by things that I had to unlearn. And I, I find that, you know, again, in retrospect, to be extremely valuable towards what I'm trying to put forward now is that, you know, most of the people that I engage in these types of conversations that haven't had their own moment of realization that there's more to life than what's physically here. You know, we start wars on who's right and wrong there, but um, very rarely do we actually offer that idea enough uh, in, a, in a way that allows us the traction to actually experience it and, and really work with it in, in, in a real way. So, um, you know, I think that distance from, from uh, structure was really a blessing for me. Um, and, and, it, and in so doing, I think a lot of what I look back on in, in my teenage years and even before it was a, a lot of it was you know going through the motions of that and you know of course that's what it's it's like for any kid um, you know you're trying to figure out what you are and how you do it and, and who you need to know and, and associate with but for me it was very much uh, you know my friends created the, the the kind of type of relationships that I really invested in um, my parents were there um, for, to help me and, and for structure uh, and my my grandparents really kind of provided a template that I thought really represented the way we needed to operate with the world. Um, so that would probably be the best answer I could offer. 
Is this your grandmother that we're seeing in this the picture we've got here now yeah. at all? Yeah, it cool. is. Yeah. yeah, that's sitting uh, on the on the on the porch at Figure Eight, shooting the bull. You know. Yeah, yeah. By the way, in your background there in the picture and where you're sitting and talking from, I gotta throw something out because I almost always is that a um, is that a slingshot that we're seeing behind you in the window? Here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's a. Uh, that's a little prototype we take to trade shows. Um, we, we we used to work with what's called the Vortex Brewer, and we, we're now making okay. a, a version of it called the Microbe Maker. And it makes compost tea. It structures water, um, so it's it's really quite a profound, simple contraption, actually. Well, I'll tell you, when you see it from where I'm looking, it looks like what's sitting on the windowsill could be the what you'd hold on to, and that there's a a loop and that it could be a slingshot. That's what I was, uh, <laughs> right a little on. bit of that. Um, well, here's a we'll, we'll transition a little bit, move away from a little bit more on your personal life side to your to your thought process, because this is a word that gets just different definitions from uh, all kinds of perspectives. Mm. Um, what does the word sustainability mean to you? Oh, I I think that um, I think there's a limitation of language relative to what the way it has come to be used. Um, you know, the first word I think of is greenwashing. And that concept of, you know, I, I remember doing an, a, a calculation uh, when I first became aware of biofuels, and this was maybe a decade ago, and, you know, this idea that of, of the sustainability uh, of, of ethanol and biofuel production. And it's, you know, it is entirely sustainable once you've grown the crop that you've, you know, processed into the oil. Uh, but what's not calculated into that is the amount of biocides and fertilizers that it takes to actually produce it. And, uh, and the calculation was along the lines of, you know, it takes as much energy to create the anhydrous ammonia on a three-acre application of corn as it would take for you and I to get in a Toyota Camry and drive from Wilmington on the East Coast to Seattle, Washington on the West Coast and have a tank of gas left. So the, the takeaway being the amount of energy that we put into producing things that we deem sustainable uh, leaves a, a lot to be desired. Um, so, you know, as far as sustainability goes, I, I think you really have to look at it from, you know, not only an economic perspective, which is really the, you know, the focus of, of modern society and, and politics and all of these things that have the influence of creating a society that we want to live in. Um, but, but I think it's also from um, a personal standpoint. You know, a lot of what I see from the outside looking in and from above is, you know, we really, we've come to somehow uh, value profit over people. And, you know, when we design systems and ways of interacting and living that, uh, you know, I invented a word, uh, I call it depructed. You know, this idea that, you know, we're doing things in the name of progress and productivity that actually undermine what we would want if we were asked, which is kind of a fascinating concept because there is no word for that. Um, I mean, it could be as simple as driving a car down the road. It gets you from A to B, but, you know, we're polluting the earth. We're using resources from people that could arguably be our enemies. Um, you know, it's a finite resource and all of the other arguments that come with peak oil and these types of things. So, you know, I think when we really start to evaluate what we're doing and we can put it in terms that allow us to actually be sustainable, and it may even, you know, it's kind of like organic. It's like the word is what it is, but it's become to mean something different. And it becomes very difficult to talk about um, outside of the ability to show it. So, you know, one of the things that I've held in my back pocket all the way through this project from the almost the very beginning was, you know, imagine you could show true sustainability of, of producing more value than you use, and you could measure that. Um, and who wouldn't invest in that? You know, that that's the end of business it, when you can really in, invest in something that is is providing true value. So, I, I think that's one way of looking at what sustainability is. It's not just the concept of usage. It's actually what, what value are you producing? Uh, and then coming up with ways of measuring that to the extent of being able to encourage it um, rather than, you know, the opposite, which is basically the way in which we operate in the modern world, very consumer-oriented. This is not one of the questions that we had specifically talked about, but it's in this context. I struggle sometimes when I describe to people that I'm involved in 
some kind of agriculture, so words, sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture, permaculture, all of those. Right. If, if you were to use any of those terms or another one, and, and you're wonderful at coming up with terms, <laughs> disruptive, I love that. You, had, you told me several others in other conversations that I love. Oh. What would be a term that describes best the kind of agriculture that you that you feel that we as a culture or as a as a as a planet ought to be following. Well, yeah, good well, word. well, I got one for it. Uh, we call it bioenergetic agriculture, and it's you, you know in a sense it, it encapsulates what modern agriculture misses, which is um, you know the the biological um, aspect of things. You know we have organic farming, um, but it doesn't focus on microbial diversity, for example, um, and microbes are what make soil. You know, they try drinking a beer without yeast. You know, it, it defeats the whole purpose of what the beer is, or the bread, or the cheese, or what it is. And it's the same in soil. So there's a lack of focus on on microorganisms and biology in that respect. And and, and energetics um, is completely discounted by any kind of uh, mature modern farming system, save biodynamic agriculture. So you know, I coined the word as a way of, of encapsulating it. I've always believed that in, unless you can um, you know, see something and you can make it outside of yourself, that it doesn't become real. You can't work with it in the same way. Um, and, and so you know, in that respect, um, bio, bioenergetic agriculture is physical, mineral, biological, and energetic. Those are the four platforms, uh, the capacities of a living system. And if you think physical and mineral are conventional agriculture, you, you plow and you fertilize. Um, organic you know, at least certifiable organic growing brings in the biological component. Um, you know, while not focusing on biological and microbial diversity, it is organic fertilizers feed microbes. That's why they're that much more productive. But both completely ignore the energetic. Um, so what Rudolf Steiner did in the 1920s was respond to uh, farmers that were essentially asking him um, to give them methods to regenerate the life force of their farms. This was in Europe at the, um, in the 1920s. And you know, they just started to use chemical fertilizers and they were experiencing uh, mostly disease in animals um, that they'd never seen before. And these farmers got together and brought Steiner in and said, look, Mr. Steiner, will, Dr. Steiner, will you help us understand how we can, you know, get back uh, the methods of farming that we've come to be used to? Um, and that was the agriculture course. And it's now, you can access it as a book. It was eight lectures. And he brought forward these methods that allow you to work with the energetic capacity of life. But he wasn't asked uh, about soil testing or microbial diversity or you know soil structure and all of these things that are entirely relevant to the farmer. Um, so his, he championed the energetic component, but this you know ignored the other ones. So what we're trying to do is bring together a platform that uh, you know really addresses from a consultative level uh, the physical, mineral, biological, and energetic capacities of life, so that one we can be aware of them uh, because. You know, the irony is uh, the capacity of humanity, if we're not aware of them with our ideas, we can't work with it. Um, and then, you know, also allows people to address, uh, you know, the soil testing through. We have a soil testing and prescription process, uh, compost teas for biological diversity, uh, and really allow people to think about those four components. And, and what we find is, you know, conventional farming is, is drowning. Organic gardening and farming is, is treading water. Uh, and bioenergetic uh, agriculture is really swimming where you want to go, uh, and, and that's a really easy way I think of grasping the, the concept of what we're trying to put forward. Very cool. Um, again, I, I, we've talked about Rolf Steiner and other uh, people in, the, in, in your life, your grandparents. Is there anyone else in the sustainability or environmental area that has had a really profound impact on how you live your life, how you run your business and so on. Any other names that are out there? Yeah, well, I, th I think one that comes to mind is Wendell Berry. Um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to see him speak several times at the Acres Conference, um, which if no one's you know, ever heard of that conference is really the, uh, a champion of kind of the, the super sensible uh, energetic components of life. It's not all, all about of, of farming. Uh, it's not all about that, but they, but they don't shy away from it in the way that conventional agriculture and even organic agricultural does agriculture does and uh, he, he was uh, he, he's an inspiration because he's a farmer uh, he's a poet you know he's really lived the life that he's communicating and in a lot of ways that's really what I'm seeking to do you know we started a farm in our town last year um, we had 75 people in a community supported agriculture program this spring uh, it just ended a couple of weeks ago 
and you know we're feeding 75 families and selling produce at markets and restaurants and you know really trying to get my hands in the ground you know from a personal standpoint I think I've always kind of yearned to 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 grow things um, but I, my work and business career really took me on a different arc for about 10 15 years there um, where I was working on businesses um, and, and I wasn't didn't have my hands in the dirt and so this opportunity now that I've kind of come full circle uh, I've got this structure that I'm trying to implement and it's, it's really allowed me to get down to the basics of what it is that is is so foreign from everyone I mean me included uh, we don't grow up learning how to be a farmer it's something that's so, you know results in food being so far away from us we don't even know what it is anymore um, so you know I, th I think the answer is is you know not only uh, awareness and education towards these things but it's also the eating of, of good food and what, what I found interesting I was talking to my wife about this the other night is you know I, I really and again I can't say that there's really any conscious effort on my part but what I've really done is created a, a business that kind of forced me to live my ideals um, in this very interesting way I, I didn't come to it with it all figured out um, matter of fact the first year I ran Progressive Gardens I mean I can remember it I, I probably wasn't wearing a shirt uh, it was hot because I didn't have any air conditioning. I was working a second job, and I was writing the website at progressivegardens.com. That's no longer there in this context, but I basically just organized my thoughts on all the things that I needed to know to be what I was telling myself I was, and then I went out and learned it all. Um, so, you know, I, I guess part of what we're trying to do now is to make that process easier for the average person because we really aren't equipped with the things that we need to know in order to evaluate what we need to know, uh, and on and on. Um, so, you know, Wendell Berry is a, a very big inspiration in terms of, of living the actual capacity of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, I, I've drawn inspiration from Victor Schauberger, uh, Nikola Tesla, a, a lot of, you know, Wilhelm Reich, a lot of these people that carried the mantle of this, you know, bioenergetic agriculture, for lack of a better word, before it really needed to be bioenergetic agriculture. These, we, we didn't make these things up. We're, we're more trying to remember them, uh, if anything. By the way, let's not say it's the lack of a better word. It is the new word, bioenergetic <laughs> There you go. Uh, all right. Um, stories are always fun. We love to hear stories. You just gave us one about a, you know, early on in progressive gardening and you're, you're working outside without a shirt on. Can you think of any other just fun stories, fun because they're funny or fun just because there's some curiosity, anything related to them? over your your business career and even even more recently that you can just tell us about and if we have some visuals we might even show some of those sure sure yeah I uh, I guess sequentially there's two that come to mind I, I you know the first one was I, I was lucky enough to go to Africa for about eight days um, I think this might have been around 2005 um, and my cousin was in the Peace Corps and over there and had been there for about a year at the by the time I went over there, so he knew everywhere to go. Because of course the place is just gigantic. You know, um, you can't even imagine how how the expanse of space and how big things are. It's just on a whole nother platform. What we're used to seeing, or I'm used to seeing, where I live and in the states. Um, but you know, so he knew knew where to take us. And you know, I'd already started Progressive Gardens, and um, you know, I had the opportunity to meet some farmers over there. And you know, one gauge the unbelievable abilities of the African people. Um, I mean, you, you drive down a road one day and then you drive down it the next day and, you know, 20 yards of trees by the side of the road had all been felled by hand, you know, and here were these people logging. I mean, it was just, it was just unbelievable, the capacity of the people, uh, particularly given the lack of resources. Um, but I remember me meeting this uh, Dutch farmer and he had lived there, Peter Sheriff was his name, uh, and he had been lived there for 25 years and when, when he, he first came down the road from he literally drove all the way south uh, into Zambia, South Central Africa, and uh, he was telling us all kinds of stories about you know driving down the dirt roads and how there was no development, and you basically just stake your claim over there. You don't buy real estate like it is here. So he just kind of pulled up to this quasi clearing and has spent the last 25 years clearing the land and building his home, and he built his home out of all materials that came from the land. Uh, and this guy, in the middle of Zambia, um, with a, a power grid that amounts to a, a solar panel was growing tobacco um, and he was growing he was starting the tobacco uh, hydroponically and you know one of the things that Progressive Gardens uh, started with and, and it's still kind of champions and, and it's a bit unique is hydroponic agriculture and that's you know the concept <laughs> of growing plants without soil 
Um, so he was doing this, and, and, and many, come to find out, many tobacco farmers do this, uh, but they do it because they can transplant the tobacco starts to the field without dis dis disrupting the root system and, and stressing the plant. So he was doing all of the right things by the book and had been taught by the local authorities, and you know, but but didn't wasn't aware to aerate the water for the roots and was getting pythium and fusarium and die off and you know twenty to thirty percent of his crop. And a simple conversation with him changed the whole dynamic. Um, you know, I explained the idea of, of you know dissolved oxygen and water and how roots respire and how that's the reason that he was getting the root disease was not contamination, but it was the stress of the plant making it vulnerable, no different than a, you know, a human eating fast food for every meal. We make movies out of it. You know? uh, we just don't apply it to the greater concept of life and even our landscapes for that matter, uh, not to mention our gardens. So you know, that, that was a pretty amazing experience. Here I was, this guy that started a garden store, not knowing what he was doing, taught himself in about a year how to talk about it, use Google for the rest of it, and I was in the middle of Africa having this conversation mm -hmm. that basically changed this guy's life. And it was pretty heavy for me in a good way, you know. It it, it in, empowered me because it, it really showed me that, you know, I, I basically knew more than the experts in South Central a Africa uh, on how to approach a hydroponic application. So, you know, that that was a pretty interesting experience. <coughs> um, is and, this picture, by the way, where you, you're standing here, and, and the other yeah. one ahead? Is, is this somewhere near that area, just so it, people can get a perspective? Yeah, it is. That's actually I. I've, I don't recall the name of the of the game preserve, but uh, between that ridge that we're on, which is you know amounts to a foothill uh, here, it was seven miles to the next one, and there was just it, it basically was like a, a big uh, swimming pool for animals almost. You know there wasn't a lot of you know across uh, pollination, I guess you would say, of, of the animals in the different regions, um, but they were very tightly managed, which of course is you know, expected in the way that humans use land and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, that, that image is on the top of a, of a hill, of a campsite that we had. And I think we must have stood there for hours just watching it like TV. You know, it, the picture doesn't do us justice. You could see the rivers meandering down on the, the floor. We could even see, uh, you know, elephants moving around. They look like ants. And it was just kind of an, it was an amazing, awe-inspiring experience. Have you been able to stay in touch with uh, Mr. Sheriff um, through you know, through the years after you were there? You know, I, I haven't, and I've had the thought many a time. Uh, I talked with my cousin. I, I saw him several weeks ago, and I asked him if he had his, his contact information. It's funny you asked that. And and he said he could probably look it up, so I'd, I'd, I'd have to send him a note, see where he's at these days. I haven't anybody, talked with him. Anybody in our audience is, uh, can help um, can help us out here. Let's see if we can find Mr. Sheriff. And we can, <laughs> wouldn't that be uh, a riot? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, and that's a great story. And and you know what's very cool about it is that I bet everybody watching this could ha can have that kind of impact on people. Um, yeah. And um, and you know even if it's only from your side, but my guess is it's not. It's from his also. If we were able to talk to him too, mm -hmm. um, fairly minor experience, um, but yet could be significant. It certainly is for you. You're remembering mm -hmm. it now. And like I said, I bet it is for him also. And yet, you know, it came out of, of uh, surprise on your part because you didn't think that there's any way that you could have known as much as this guy who's been doing this for 25 years. And that's right. Value. That's right. Um, I had an amazing situation about five years ago where I heard a guy from Ghana say, you know, please teach us how to feed ourselves because we're just as smart as you are. We just don't know how to do it. Um, and the second part of that made total sense to me, but honestly, I wasn't sure that I was admitting that he was just as smart as I was before he said that. And the reality is he and everybody is, and it is just what we do and what we don't know. So in his yeah. case, he was a smart man. He was doing everything the way that he thought he should, but he just didn't know. And so he needed somebody like you to come and, and, and tell, some, tell him something in his life. Um, so here's a change of direction in, in the opposite way. Um, can you tell us about one memorable experience in your life um, that wasn't so positive um, that actually, as you look back on it now, even though it wasn't good at the time, you can realize now, you know what, that was something that really has molded me into a better person. So it was a bad experience that turned out to be uh, one that's, that's actually made you a better person today. Yeah, I, I would uh, maybe have a two-pronged answer there. You know. From a personal standpoint, I, I think I could probably speak to my parents' divorce. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to 
really view that in positive terms. But I, but as I was describing earlier, I, I really think that it worked to, to allow the, the playing field that resulted in, in who I am today. I, and, I, I, you know, I guess you could look back to any number of experiences and imagine how it may have changed you as a person. But for me, that was pretty seminal. Um, and, you know, from a business standpoint, it happened later on. I I'd had a company... Uh, called Progress Earth, and uh, I, th I believe that's the capacity uh, of when we first met. And um, we were working on um, developing uh, products primarily at the time, and I, I had made enough uh, noise in, in terms of the, the differentness and the types of things that we were doing to attract some people having an interest in wanting to work with us. And I, I met some guys that um, you know proved to not be the best business partners, um, and took me for a ride that, and I don't mean that in the sense that they would, they were, uh, you know, they were taking advantage of me in any way, but they, they built, they brought a lot of money to the table. They, uh, you know, had experiences in sales and marketing that I did not have. I uh, knew how to use a lot of the technologies, like the things that you're, you're championing over there. Um, and, and, you know, it really taught me an incredible amount and in a very short period of time. And, it didn't end up well. Uh, it was a situation where you know we incurred a, a large debt building a big mansion um, for a business who wasn't ready for it, and uh, it taught me you know what to do on many levels, but it, it mostly taught me what not to do. Um, and I and I think that that has been probably the most profound business negative business experience that I've had. That you know I, I think in in any good negative business experience is teaching you the lesson, you know, and, and I, I believe that I've, I've learned a very valuable one there. Tell us about something you've learned in the last year, let's say, that is you're using it and you're just going, wow, I, I wish I would have known about this earlier. Something you can share with our audience that's that's rather new knowledge that you've got that, that that's influencing what you're doing in life. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, God, within the last year, um, I'd, I'd, I'd probably point to, to something that we're, um, that we're developing. Um, you know, I can't really speak to any sort of technological platform. I we use a lot of, uh, of those sorts of things. Uh, it's not necessarily my personal uh, direction in the company to, to build that sort of thing up. But um, I, I think it's really a matter of, you know, I, maybe I put it in these terms. We're, we're looking for the value of space. Um, and, and as I see it, you know, a lot of farming is not in, in food production. Um, and I think this can be applied to a lot of different things, but I guess particularly in agriculture, is that, you know, one of the limitations is we can't produce enough value in the space that's available. And that could be because it's in an urban environment. It could be, um, you know, it's not close enough to people. Or it could be any number of things. So, you know, the mindset of, of, of really applying um, job costing um, and the, the actual true cost of what it takes to do things uh, is a bit of an art. And, um, you know, I, I, I hearken back to the conversation about the guy that you were telling me about in British Columbia that, you know, grossed over $80,000 on a third of an acre um, on a bike. And, and that is, is completely mind-blowing. Um, yeah. yeah. We're going to interview Curtis sometime here soon. So. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I think really trying to take a mindset towards things um, from that value standpoint, you know, that idea of sustainability, I guess, is another way into it, um, is it, something that is, is really going to become valuable as, as we move forward. You know, we're applying that in ways, we have a program we call food lawns, and we're searching for that value of space, and you know, if you can grow $100 in basil in 50 square feet on someone's lawn, and you have 10 people in a neighborhood doing that, there's $1,000 a month, and there's a salary in there for people that, you know, want to take advantage of that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm reaching out to a lot of uh, professors locally and people that have a real mind towards these types of things. Um, and I've seen unbelievable value come out of that. I, I, I think a way of broadening it to, to the nature of your question is, you know, over my business career, I'd say up, up until about maybe three or four years ago, I was really gut driven. You know, if it was a good idea, I did it. And if I, there was money in the bank account, I spent it. Um, and, you know, it, it, it created a lot of amazing opportunity that I'm now able to leverage, uh, but it also created a lot of stress for me in that, you know, you got to pay the bills. Um, so, you know, coming out of that, I think, you know, being able to organize yourself in a way that um, really provides true value and cost towards what you're doing allows you to do more of what it is that you're trying to do. Um, 
So I, I don't know, maybe that was a sideways answer to your question, but... No, no, that's a great... No, that was, I mean, that's that was what perfect. comes to mind. Um, so it's it's job costing, you know, realizing that, that there's a bigger picture, and, and so maybe it's a, it's a little bit of the that profit piece related to the people pro profit planet sort of definition some people give for sustainability. We have a train, we're right next to a train location, and we've had something going on. I got to share this. Somebody chime in or tell me if they've ever heard of this. Uh, and you hear a train whistle is just happening not very often right now. And that, that's not a train going by. And this is the second time in five years I've noticed this. We have a train that sits outside of this location <coughs> where it'll be there for at least a week. And it's, it's, and it's just sitting there. And it's running. The engine's running all the time. And I think it's because they're refrigerating something. But somebody's got to help me and understand why you would have a train sit with refrigeration <laughs> For a week long, ever, and I'm not <laughs> sure what the value of that is. So, um, it just you know, there's there's all kinds of things going on sometimes that we're not quite aware of. Mm. Um, well, we're getting close to our time. I've thrown out to everybody in our audience to ask any questions that they would have again if they've got them. Um, Emily, how many we, how many we have online that we're in there? It showed the total. Uh, Seventy five people. Seventy five people. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so. Tell us about a book that you've read recently that's influencing you. We've just got three really last questions here, and then I'm going to let you finish by telling us just anything that you'd like to to finish up. So uh, you've talked about uh, Rudolf Steiner's book before, but is there anything you've read recently that you could share with us that you've really enjoyed? Yeah, I, I'm in. Uh, I'm a very literal reader. My wife is is pushing me more towards the fiction, um, but I. Uh, I've been reading this book. It's it's the uh, actually got it right here. It's the the fourth phase of water uh, by Dr. Gerald Pollack. He's a professor at, at the University of Washington, and um, he's championing the concept of what he calls easy water, uh, and it's an acronym for exclusion zone. And it it really is is part of the answer uh, to the anomalies that we experience with water, like ice floating on top of water or, or surface tension and hydrogen bonding allowing you know bugs to float across the surface of a lake um, so we're, we're all well aware of those but there's really a lack of inadequate explanation and Dr. Pollack has waded into that environment with some extremely um, analytical data that really illustrates this uh, in a direct way and he's asking the broader conversation of you know you know again it's kind of one of those concepts where the further we look the less we know we really don't know what water is um, you know we've got a, a physical structure for it in, in a textbook, but we've never seen a water molecule. Um, so, th you know, this idea that, that water organizes itself towards a charged surface, and, and it creates this exclusion zone, the easy water, that is a bit between, it's like a colloid, it's between a solid and a, and a liquid. So it has a structure, but it's still fluid. Um, and, it, and it starts to, you know, explain a lot of the benefits of, of you know, easy water is what happens inside of a cell uh, that facilitates the metabolic processes of how water is used. So water for me is in, you know, we could probably have a whole other program uh, on water, um, but it's a primary nutrient. And unfortunately, we tend to think of it uh, passively and as just something to dissolve things in or to hydrate our bodies. Incidentally, you can drink half your weight in ounces in water a day, which we're recommended to do to not be medically dehydrated and still be dehydrated measurably, uh, because the water is in the incorrect molecular structure to hydrate our cells. It's just irrigating our kidneys. And the same is true, true in agriculture. A lot of the, the amounts of fertilizers that we use are there to push it into the plant, rather than leveraging water's ability to do that for us naturally. Uh, we're pushing instead of allowing the flow. Um, so that book is, uh, is a game changer for me, because it, you know, anytime I can find actual data that builds a bridge from something that really is almost impossible for you know, the collective to grasp on its face uh, that really contributes toward that ability to allow us to understand it uh, is extreme value. So, uh, Give us the title again. Give us the yeah, title it's called, and author. It's called The Fourth Phase of Water, uh, Gerald Pollack. Gerald Pollack, okay. Yeah, Gerald okay. Pollack. All right, well, I just have two more questions. Um, and, I, and you, again, may have even answered one of these, but... Is there a quote or a phrase, because you've given a couple of them earlier, from anyone famous that you can remember um, that, that it is just something our audience should have, is just memorable for them? Yeah, um, I think there's two of them. One, one of them is from Steiner. Uh, he was asked, you know, 
I, someone observed that he was spending a lot of time instilling spiritual truths and um, concepts, and people, you know, weren't really gravitating towards it. And he, he was asked, well, "Why is that? You know, is that that must be frustrating? Well, why are people not taking you up on these concepts?" And he said that it was a matter of nutrition. And he said, uh, slightly paraphrased, but he said basically that food plants no longer contain the forces people need to carry their will into action. And that's in the, the foreword of the agriculture course. Um, and that it still gives me the chills when I say it because that I think that was the quote that really started it all for me in terms of the current context. It was, it was uh, you know, food, the, the, the forces that come from our food no longer allow us to carry our will into action. I mean, that's such a profound statement. And for me, it really addresses everything that we can look around and see that's wrong in the world and nobody's changing. Um, so that would be one, and, and I think the other one would be a, a Bucky Fuller quote. Uh, but Mr. Fuller, he, he, he said something to the extent of, uh, you know, you, you can't defeat uh, systems uh, by engaging them directly. You have to, to develop new ones that undermine the significance of the old. Um, I think you maybe put it up on the screen there, so I, I may have butchered the quote, but, um, but the point is, is very valid. You know, you, you can complain about the system that we're involved in all day, and if you try to fight that system, you carry the burden of proof, and and that's really a lot of, of why some of the most progressive concepts uh, in modern health and agriculture get stifled. Is that the individual or the group of, of people that has come to these realizations then needs to talk the rest of the world into them, um, and that's a that's a you know a real tall task. So you know I think that quote has merit. I think if you can work on creating a system that provides value, people gravitate to it. Period, um, and then it's the responsibility of the rest of the world to catch up to it. Uh, so, that, you know, that's, I, I kind of carry those two kernels with me in all, almost everything that I do. Awesome. Just so everybody knows, just because, and you may have said it, but I didn't hear it, is that Buckminster Fuller, who's really well known for his geodesic dome theories and such, which is right. obviously he's holding one here or, or something <laughs> like that and as, he's, as the quote's in front of it. Um, last question. And then everybody, if you've got questions, bring them in. Emily's actually grabbing some that might be coming in over our, our meerkat feed that, that we're still doing here. Um, and this is a fun one, and I steal this or stolen this from John Lee Dumas, who's a really famous and popular now, or popular and now famous podcaster. And he has a show called Entrepreneurs on Fire, and he actually does it every day. And he gives this exact same question. He calls it a doozy. Um, by the way, and um, and here's the question: If you woke up tomorrow and you found that you were on another planet that was just like Earth, all of your daily needs were taken care of, um, but you all you had was a laptop and five hundred dollars, what would you be doing for the next seven days? I think I think that's a fascinating question. Um, I th the, the knee-jerk answer is, you know, I guess I'm so steeped in the work that I'm doing that I'd probably be doing exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think um, for me, my, my, my work is, is a big part of my life. I, I don't, um, you know, my, ch my challenge is to not let it consume me. Um, so, you know, I, I'm happy to, to answer that, that I, I would be doing this things in the context of what I'm doing now. Um, but I, I think if, if you really take that question from a different angle and, you know, you had the ability um, to go do what you wanted, um, I think very specifically it, w it would be to travel uh, with my family and uh, and really, you know, carry the message forward of, of what it is that we're doing and, and trying to change the way food has grown uh, for the better. Um, so, you know, I, I have a very... It's funny, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, all of the, the, the rules and regulations of, of the question that you asked me, you know, is it the world is exactly the same way and I have $500, a part of me says, well, that I wouldn't stand a chance. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, maybe there's three different answers there for you. I'm not, I'm not sure how that qualifies, but uh, uh, there you go. One you can interpret all different other kinds of ways. <laughs> yeah, right. We are right up against it now in terms of our time. And I'm just going to throw it out real quickly. Anybody's got any questions, throw them in. We've gotten lots of information here today. I would highly encourage you to come and watch the replay. We'll edit it some to where we get rid of some of the little bits of, uh, of, of issues we might have had, although everything came across really well here. Evan, this has been so fun. Um, mm -hmm. I'm so much looking forward to staying, you know, 
not just in touch, but but alongside you and supporting what you're doing moving ahead. I know we've talked about that, and, and we're going to be moving ahead and, and I think collaborating on some things and, and working together. So um, thanks so much, and I'm sort of stalling here a little to see if we have any questions. Emily, are we getting anything from there? Um, so how do we end up with PeopleWise up on the Meerkat? Uh, 91. 91. Wow, that's very <laughs> cool. We'll see how. And by the way, Meerkat also gets replayed so people can watch it in the in also. Um, I want to thank Emily and Deb for their help here. Evan, thank you for, for being with us today. Um, in two weeks, we have um, a speaker that's going to be talking about heritage um, sheep. Her name is Nancy, and right now I can't remember her last name. I should, but I don't have it right here. As always, it'll be fun. Remember, we'll make a replay of this. We'll post it all over our number of different websites. We'll make sure to get Evan um, also so he can post it up with uh, different places that he might want to have it. And we always get a lot more people that watch the replays than watch live. Um, this has been fun. I've, I've learned a lot. Rudolf Steiner, uh, Mr. Sheriff, um, the, the, the last one, the book about easy water, um, Buckminster Fuller and some of his quotes, all oh, really cool stuff. Evan, do you have anything, last thing you want to say before we jump off? Oh, just the, the work that you're doing is a blessing. I, I can't wait to continue to work with you. And uh, I'd invite everybody to, it's just a splash page, but please visit beagriculture.com. Uh, and, you know, that, that'll get you to a place where you can access a lot of the work that we're doing. Uh, and there's, you know, the best is yet to come. As, as I like to say, the beginning is near. Awesome. Well, Evan, thank you so much. And we'll sign off from Northern Colorado and from North Carolina in the middle of the summer in both places. And we'll see everybody in a couple of weeks or when you come and watch on replays.